Hello everyone, hey, thanks for clicking on this video, coming to check it out. I am super excited to bring this to you. I think this is a gold mine, uh, and I really hope that you feel the same. This is a long form video, if you couldn't tell. Uh, you can see the timestamp there, it's about, we're over two hours, I think, but I think, honestly, this is just full of nuggets, full of really good insights, full of really good knowledge and uh, learning. So this is a video uh, that I did with a good friend of mine, Matt, Matt E, Matt Ernschwender, sorry if I butcher your last name, buddy. Uh, we, uh, I, I went up and asked him. I just said to him, hey, Matt, dude, you are a guru. You are a ninja when it comes to binary exploitation. You're a wizard in reverse engineering and this sort of stuff. And I'm not, truthfully. So I wanted to kind of capture his knowledge and insight when uh, I said, like, look, dude, would you be cool with doing a couple videos with me on YouTube? Uh, so this is the first one. If we do more, maybe let me know if you guys like this sort of thing. Um, would you be willing to do videos with me on YouTube where you sort of walk me through doing binary exploitation challenges and telling me how you would approach it, what you do and what scenarios, et cetera, et cetera. Because I think that would be super good for learning. I said like, let's take a look at some of the Pico CTF challenges so we can start fundamental and maybe get into more advanced stuff. Uh, but I think all of this will still be super helpful and super useful. So this is footage of Matt and I getting together, hanging out and working on some binary exploitation challenge. Um, I think this is awesome because it goes through reverse engineering in Ghidra, uh, debugging in GDB with GEF or Jeff or however you want to say that uh, plugin and extension, uh, troubleshooting, trying to understand why our exploit doesn't work the first time, fixing problems, understanding problems, and just going through extremely thoroughly the whole process. So yes, it's a fundamental thing. Um, it's just setting the foundation, but I hope if you are someone that's interested in this sort of thing, I hope this will be a really good video with uh, lots, uh, lots of stuff to learn from, and uh, maybe we can do more of this if you really, really like it. So with that said, I know this was a long intro and it's going to be a long video, so I'm sorry for yapping, but let's get to it. This is footage from me hanging out with Matt. Uh, I'm recording this intro in the future, as to when I recorded that in the past, so I <laughs> my hair will be longer, but I just happen to be wearing the same shirt that we recorded this thing in. Anyway, let's get to it. I'll see on the other side. Hello. Oh, you're good. <laughs> How's it going? Oh, um, I realized kind of at the couple minutes in, I didn't have Matt's audio for like the first couple minutes. So, <laughs> so hey, stupid mistake. Uh, I realize it happens all the time. It was an accident. Uh, thankfully, we caught it before we got into the real reverse engineering and binary exploitation, writing code, etc. cetera. Uh, but we did miss some of our initial setup. So I'll walk us through that here. Uh, very first thing we do is that we're gonna take a look at the challenge that we're gonna tackle. Uh, we're going through Pico CTF, their challenge from the 2021 competition called Here's a LibC, which should be a return to LibC kind of attack that we would typically do in like binary exploitation and that sort of trend. Next, we got started kind of preparing some tools and utilities that we knew would help with us in this process for solving the challenge. Uh, we know we're going to be using GDB or the GNU debugger to debug and kind of step through the code as it works through our exploit. And Matt tends to use Jeff or GEF for GDB enhanced features as a plugin or kind of extension you could use with the GNU debugger to aid in exploit development. So he wanted to get me kind of spun up with Jeff. So I went to go check out the documentation online and I tried to install it. Uh, originally, they offer some kind of quick install script that you could w get down and then pipe into sh. That didn't exactly work all that well for me and I don't always like to just w get content and spin it right into bash or sh that's typically a bad idea uh so anyway i just git cloned the official repository and i figured okay we can install this kind of manually with the pip install the requirements.txt file and get it spun up then all that we needed to really do was add in a source command into our gdb init file that would kind of initialize as gdb starts up so it could make sure to run that jeff script then I just wanted to verify I had all the tools that we might need. We have Ghidra, we have Pwn tools. You can see I just kind of sanity checked them there. And uh, I mentioned to Matt that typically I tend to use PEDA or PEDA or the Python Exploit Development Assistance extension for GDB. Now, 
Matt told me, hey, Jeff might be a better working one. You could use some really cool stuff like telescope. So I thought, hey, if I'm, all, I'm all here to learn. So I wanted to give that a try. Then we started to download the files that the Pico CTF challenge would offer us for this here's a libc task. It would offer the binary file that I would go ahead and just w get down, as well as the libc or libc.so.6. Now, because this is going to be giving us a libc with the binary, we know that, hey, maybe we're going to end up doing some return to libc attacks. Uh, I grabbed the make file just as well in case there's any strange kind of command line flags or arguments that are passed when that binary is compiled. And then I just kind of spit together a stupid, easy connect.sh script so I can keep track of the netcat host name and the port number. Then Matt kind of drives me down the road here where uh, we would normally start to work with these files. We will have a vuln script, or excuse me, the vulnerable program and the libc that we could use. But when I try and execute the vuln or this program in binary, it ends up spitting out a segmentation fault. So there is a new problem that we kind of have to work through, and Matt walks me through this. Matt explains that the problem is that this binary or the vuln program that we would kind of check out with LDD to see the imports or what libraries it might load in, it will work with libc given in the current directory that we just downloaded, but it needs to be linked in a specific way with kind of the matching version. Now, it's going to use the linker that I have installed on my computer, not what would have been used on the challenge server or wherever this, com this binary was originally compiled. So we need to know the version of the libc and match it so that we could link it properly. We could kind of figure out the version in a couple different ways. We could try and just run the libc as if it were a binary and it would give us, hey, maybe the strings or the version number that would expect. Uh, that didn't work in our case, so we could simply try and run strings on the libc. We could grep for GCC or a version number, and we can see there that, okay, this is expecting a 2.27 version. Now we would want to grab the appropriate linker that would match that. I'm running on Ubuntu 20.04, so if I were to take a look at my own linker that would expect to match my own libc version, there it is on my machine in lib64, I could check out the version yet again, but if I were to see the strings of my own, we can tell, okay, maybe that's expecting 2.32, which does not match 2.27. So maybe we could run a couple different Docker containers with older versions of Ubuntu to see if any of them match that specific libc version. I could go check out the directory for linkers and what they would expect, and we could track this down, grep for the version, but oh, we'll see 2.29. Uh, and then we could try a later version of Ubuntu, maybe 18.04 or going back to 16.04, et cetera, et cetera. That is a tedious process. Like it could work, but we're kind of just playing whack-a-mole with guess and check. So Matt suggests a better option, which is to use this tool and utility Pwn in it. And this is handy for setting up a binary exploitation challenge. It will start to build out a challenge script for you. It will help determine what libc or linker version that you might need. So I go ahead and again, git clone this process. I try and run it from the directory that it started in and then it spits out a solve.py script when I'm not actually working on a challenge. So really you should run that within the directory that you're already working with the binaries in. Then it will go ahead and create a solve.py script, and it might determine, okay, you need this specific linker, ld2.27.so. You can see it there. Now, if I were to run the vulnerable program with that linker, the program would run just fine. That's perfect. That's great. That's what we want. The problem is if I were to try and run that .vuln program on its own without specifying that linker, it wouldn't work still. So we could use the utility patch elf. And this is another one that Matt recommended where you can kind of modify the binary and tell it, hey, strictly use this linker that we've supplied that we were able to retrieve from Pwnanit. So that is kind of the dynamic duo there, using Pwnanit to track down that linker libc version as you need it, and then use patch elf to go ahead and get that set up with the binary. 
All right, we're finally done with all that prep and setup. I'm super sorry for that like weird commentary through the speed run of getting tools and everything ready. Uh, that was my bad. I don't know why we weren't capturing Matt's audio, but we fixed it. We found the problem before it got too late, before we got into the whole process of kind of reverse engineering and writing the binary exploitation script, etc. So uh, now, finally, we 10 minutes into this video, I can let you loose on the real raw footage with Matt. Uh, I'm going to let Matt take it away. He really just dropped drives the ship here. It's fantastic. And uh, I think there are a lot of great lessons learned. So I'll let him take it away and I'll see you on the other side. Okay. Now that we've got um, that binary set up, I think we can go ahead and get started, right? Yep. Sure. No, so the hard part's done. <laughs> awesome. <clears throat> So I have an echo server, seemingly. Yep. yep. So if you just try typing stuff, you know, your basic echo server. Great. Yeah. Okay. All right. So the first thing we should do is we should check what the protections are of the binary. Typically, whenever you get, you know, a binary, you want to check, hey, is this a dynamically linked executable? Is this a statically linked executable? Is it 64 bit, 32 bit? So you can check the um, protections by using checksec. It should be included with pwn tools. Yep. So just checksec and then the binary. Okay. So we can see we have partial railroad, which means the global offense table is read and, read and writable. Um, there's no stack canary. So if there were, was some buffer, buffer overflow in the binary, we don't have to worry about leaking the canary. Um, NX is enabled, which means that any segment of memory, which is writable, is not executable. So you can't just write shell code and then jump to it. You're going to have to get a little bit more creative. There's also no PI, which means that ASLR won't affect the binary. So every time the binary is run, the actual base address is going to be at that hex 40. 0, 0, 0, 0. It's always going to be there because pi is disabled. And then run path is just to say, hey, for looking for libraries, look for the current directory. That's how it gets, that's how it runs your libc. Gotcha. Cool. So now that we figured out protections, we figured out like kind of what it's doing just by running it. Let's try opening it up in Gidra. Okay. All right. Gidra. Gidra. <laughs> there we go. Success. And we're on the latest version now. Yeah. So it was all success. <laughs> it all worked out in the end. Okay. Right, you got your tips. All right. We're going to have to make a new project. So I will hide this, I guess. Actually, you might need to make a uh, dot yeah. directory in your home. Folder. So now is the hotkey I to open a binary. Yep. Uh, so I'm going into Pico. I'm going back to here's a libc and opening up our vom. Yes. Okay. Okay. Just setting it the L format and everything else. More import results. We already went through a lot of those import results. Just going through file and check sec. Awesome. We gotta analyze, analyze it, it, find all the uh, more details. The, do you default, do any magic? Do you click on any extras of those or? No, nah, the default analysis is good enough. I mean, there's nothing really special you're gonna need. All right, so now we go into functions. Yep, go find main. So here's the main function. Um, you can see in the uh, theme compilation, it just has a bunch of stack variables. That's where the undefined eights, undefined four, eight, and all that. Yep. So allocates a lot of memory on the stack. So there's a lot of local variables. Um, and then it does some weird, just assign some of those variables. I'm assuming just looking at this, that the uh, actual assembly code for the binary is is structured in a weird way so that the decompiler and Gidget can't really understand it. 
Hmm. So this is just the decompiler trying to interpret it, but obviously it's not going to be doing well because the with the actual assembly code itself isn't is kind of weird. So anyway, the first thing we have is as important as we have set buff. So what this will do is we have set buff, standard out, and then zero or null. What this will do in short is just make it so that the binary will behave whenever we're um, connected to it with netcat. So there's, it will just like, it works on your machine. It will work on your machine if you didn't have set buff, but if you try to netcat to it, it would just kind of be a little bit finicky. Then we have just get e group ID, get a set res GID. So this will just get your group ID and then set your set your um, real effective in um, group ID. Um, I, this isn't really needed for us because uh, we're not we're not running a set UID binary, which is obviously looks like stuff for set UID. Then we're setting some more local variables. Doesn't look too important. Just for some, if it is important, we'll go back to it, but. For now, um, as you can see, going through the function, there's no uh, user input, which if you saw, like there's no scanf or fgets or whatever, there's no user input. And as you saw with our, whenever, whenever we're running it, it just printed something out and expected user input. So as you can see, you know, we have that puts, which means, hey, that's probably our, that's just, just guessing, that's probably our printout with the welcome to the server. This right now we're just you know going over guessing and then convert case is probably you know converting the case of the string, just based on you know what we're seeing and then it actually goes into do stuff with a while true. So let's go into that function, see what's in there. Double click on it here. Yep. So now we have some variables. Um, then here's our actual scanf. So scanf is a function which is used to receive formatted input. So the format is the actual first argument for scanf. So if scanf, the first argument was percent %d, that would mean, hey, the uh, program's expecting, you know, to input a number. Or if it was percent %x, it would say, you know, the, the program's expecting you to input a hexadecimal number. And you can uh, Google all of these different, um, all of these different format specifiers for scanf to see, like, hey, what type of input we can input. But for this format specifier, which is percent square brace, that sort of like regex thing means we want to receive input up until the user enters a new line, but don't include the new line, just receive the input up until the new line. So that's what that scanf will do. Then we have the other scanf, which has that little ampersand dat whatever. So if we double click on that, see what the actual is. And if you see in the actual listing view, we have percent %c. Now it's going to be kind of uh, tedious to always go click on that dot, that ampersand dat to just try to figure out what format specifier is. But to fix it, what we can do is we know that is a percent %c, which is a string or a character array because there's no strings in C, there's only character arrays. So let's try to change the actual type of the variable. So if we do retype global after you right click, and we put char, or you can go through the type. Yeah. It's just easier to type it. Just do char, square brace, Oop. and then put a two, because we know it's two characters. And then press enter. We can see it starts to clean it up. Nice. Which is what we want. Then, then what I will do is I'll store it in the local underscore 89. So what? The reason we have two scanfs is because the first scanf will and in, will input will get the string from the user up until the new line, but we still have a new line that was pressed. That's where the percent %c will take that new line then and store it in that variable. I'm checking to see if there's any way I can make uh, the display a little bit bigger. Oh yeah, um should be in uh, edits tool options, and then just search for like font or something in the filter. Yeah. Sorry. Did not mean to derail you. It's fine. That's going to be a bit big. Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> so there, yeah. 
So we have our scan that first scan f which gets the string up until a new line, then the second scan f will actually get the new line, which is you know whenever you press the enter key. Then after we do that, we set a local underscore 10 to zero. And then we we treat that as sort of like a iterator. So we'll go, so yeah, you can call it iterator. Um, and then it'll and then we get jump into that while loop. And while it's less than a hundred. We're going to go to that convert case, right? Yep, it just calls the convert case, and then it treats that as an index into whatever string we enter. So I'm assuming what this is doing is obviously taking your string and converting the case. Right. And so we don't really have to like go into what the actual convert case function is doing because there's nothing like unknown going on. Then after that, we have a puts and we print out your string after it was convert case, and then we have a return. And then if we go back to the main, which is where the return is, I have to back a little bit more. Yeah, I think I was jumping around everywhere. Yep. Let's click on main. It's just gonna keep doing that do while loop. So it's just gonna infinitely just keep calling that do stuff function, take input. And as you saw when we were running the binary, this matches what we expect. Yep. Now, before we get to the actual vulnerability, another bug in here is that um, the variable that your string is doesn't get menset to uh, null bytes. So whenever you just uh, go into the program, run it, enter a string, and then just keep pressing enter, it will always use the same string, which I thought is pretty funny. Oh. That's that you probably saw that before, but let me. This is a small little. A good little, little Easter egg, yeah. Yeah. But as you can see, like with languages like C, you can easily make that mistake where you don't set that buffer to null bytes again. Yeah. You, you can easily see you don't set the buffer to null bytes, but there's nothing warning you that it's being set to null bytes. So you can just see how C is kind of that language where you have to manually do everything. And if you don't, if you miss one thing, it can lead to some <laughs> issues. And as you saw, that issue Definitely. was. Oh, it doesn't clear out those buffers. Can I keep printing it? So anyway, in the actual vulnerability for this, we saw it would it would read in a string, okay? But it will only read in until it reaches a new line. There's no count for the scanf. It just reads in until there's a new line. So if we just enter in like a thousand characters, then you know it, the buffer you can see right there only holds 112. So we just, yeah. The, just the classic. Spin it, spin it with A's. I think that's plenty. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and then as you can see, we have the segmentation fault core dump, which is great whenever you're doing binary exploitation. It's not great whenever you have a project. But, <laughs> um, so we got a crash, which is great. Now let's try to go inspect the crash. So what we can do is we can just run the program with GDB. GDB is, you know, the program for debugging. Debugging, default. yep. And then let's just run it. So just do R or run. Now enter in your input, which is the tons of A's. All right, you might need to zoom out here a little bit. So it crashed at this return instruction. You can see at the uh, bottom how it has that do stuff plus 156. You can see the current instruction that's being executed. Okay. Now, what a return instruction will do is it will take whatever value is at the stack. Since it's um, since it's 64-bit, it's going to get a 64-bit value or 8-byte value. So it's going to get whatever is at the stack, not whatever is in the instruction pointer. So this is what I notice a lot of common misconceptions when going from like 32-bit to 64-bit. Whenever you're doing uh, a buffer overflow on 64-bit and it gets to that return instruction, it's going to check to see, hey, is this value on the stack point to actual memory? And if it doesn't, it's just not going to execute the return instruction. So that's why you don't see your A's in the RIP. Because, gotcha. because all those A's don't actually point to a valid address in memory. So what you really want to look to is look at what your stack is. 
So if you just do examine forward slash or x forward slash g for eight bytes, x for hexadecimal space, and then dollar sign RSP, which is the pointer to our um, stack, let me print that out. What will happen at that red instruction is it will put that value, the OX414141, in the RIP. But since OX4141141 doesn't point to a valid area in memory, it's not going to execute that return instruction. Sweet. So now what we have to figure out is we know we, we uh, overflowed it. We know we have control of a value on the stack that will eventually be put into the instruction pointer. Let's try to figure out how many bytes it will take until we actually get to that instruction pointer. So luckily with Jeff, Jeff comes with tools installed to automatically do this. If you type in pattern, just That's all? pattern. Cool. Yeah. Okay. So here's the syntax of it. You can do pattern create or pattern offset. So if you worked with like, you know, Metasploit's um, pattern create or pattern offset, it, it's very similar to that. So if you just do pattern create, and then you can specify like how many bytes of input. So let's try to figure out how many bytes of input we want to put in. So let's go back to the, uh, this, the Gidra. So we can see looking at our stack variables, the actual allocated buffer is 112 bytes. But even if we overflow the 112 bytes, we don't know if it's going to overflow past the instruction pointer. Because of the way your stack's laid out, you have your local variables. Then under that, you have your saved um, RVP. You have a cannery if there's a cannery. Then you have your instruction pointer. So there's more values after your allocated buffer that you also have to overflow through the instruction pointer. So what I typically do is just round to the next um, multiple of 100. So in this instance, since our allocated buffer is 112, let's just try 200. So let's just okay. do pattern create 200. And then you nice. see it generates that string. And what this string is, to probably explain what it is. So this is called a... Um, it's, it's really called a De Bruyne sequence. And what a De Bruyne sequence means is that any subset of a set is only going to occur once. Or in this instance, um, what happens is we have a string of 200 bytes. Now, if we try to find any uh, four by, or eight bytes in that string, those eight bytes are only going to occur once. It doesn't matter where you are. You could be at the 17th byte, get the 17th, 18th, 19th, those eight bytes. See, um, take those eight bytes, compare it to your string, and it's only going to be at that 17th spot. So that's kind of how like a drawing sequence works. Um, Pwn tools, it's called cyclic or cyclic pattern. Yeah. It's probably more common because not a lot of people like saying De Bruyne sequence. <laughs> but in mathematical terms, it's a De Bruyne sequence. So now we saved it, and then we can run it on the program again. Paste it in. Yep. Classic, you know, buffer overflow. We reach the return instruction, which is what we want. We can see our stack is just overflowing with our input. So now, as you can see at RSP, it's pointing to the um, our string. Now with Jeff, what we can do is we can just use our pattern command again. Just do pattern offset. Is it pattern offset or pattern search? Oh, I guess they kind of do the same. It's yeah, pattern offset. Cool. Now just do dollar sign RSP. And that's it. Oh, okay. <laughs> that's awesome. It, as you can see, Jeff just, you know, pretty much automates the whole thing. That's There's awesome. No taking it, searching it manually. Jeff just does everything for you. So as you can see, it found two values, one for little endian and one for big endian, since, you know, x86 machines are little endian. We're going right. to get that value. So we found that 136 is where our, is how much input we have to put in until we overflow the instruction pointer. Just for a sanity check, we should probably do pattern create that 136 and then tack on a bunch of A's on it just to make sure, hey, is this actually overflowing right? So if we run it and then put a bunch of like capital A's or capital B's or whatever, 
I mean, you, can, you, you should just put eight, see if it's... Yeah. Right. But I have confidence in Jeff that it found the correct off. I do too. <laughs> <laughs> that's the days. So that's great. We know our... We know we have to input 136 bytes until we actually overflow the instruction pointer. So now that we have that, let's start actually starting to script this because obviously, you know, running it in GDB is going to get a little tedious. So let's start a little pwn tool script. Mm. Start with that, that she bang. Then we're going to do from pwn import star. I mean, generally, you should do just import pwn. Like yeah. It's a professional like, Python <laughs> project. You should you should never just do from library import everything. Yeah. Just, but since it's just you know a basic pwn tool script, we're just doing you know CTF stuff. It's fine. It's a CTF. You don't Enough. care about quality. You just yep. you just want to get it done. <laughs> All right. So. In order to interact with the uh, binary, what we can do is we can use a function in Pwn tools called process. So you just do process and then the path to the binary as the argument. And then what that returns is it returns an object that we can use to interact with the process. So yeah, P works perfectly fine. You can use IO, you can use S, whatever you want. <laughs> so then after we do that, let's, yeah, you can do p.close at the end. It's generally, uh, what you can do instead of p.close is if you do p.interactive, after um, what this will do is this will drop you into an interactive shell where you can interact with the binary on keyboard. You don't, you don't have to programmatically interact with it. Because what we're trying to do right now is we're trying to programmatically interact with it so that it makes you know writing our exploit easier. But since we do p.interactive after our exploit runs, we want to say, hey, like what actually happened? Can we just like interact with it, play around with it? So the first thing we know is we know our the amount of bytes we have to input until we reach the instruction pointer is 136. So it'd be a good idea to like make a string of 136, keep like a global that's 136, just whatever to keep track of it. And then yep, we we can uh, enter in our junk. This is our A's times that 136. Great. So now once we have our input, where do we jump to? Right, because we can't execute off the stack. Yeah. And there's also no win function you see with a normal like return to win. So this is where the whole reason why they gave us libc. So libc is if you're unfamiliar with C, what libc is, is it's a lot of helper functions that will allow you to just do various stuff on your system. So if you've ever written any C program and use printf, what's actually happening is you don't make the actual printf function. You're saying, hey, this function exists somewhere else, and that somewhere else is in libc. So whenever we do call printf, we want program execution to go into libc. Now, along with in libc, along with printf, there's a bunch of other functions. There's a uh, scanf, as you saw with how we received input. There's puts, which is how we displayed stuff. There's setbuff, which is what you saw in the binary. But there's also a function called system. And if you just look at the man page for system, what it does is. Is that call three? Yeah. yeah. C is three for like. C functions. Yep. Execute a shell command. So it's just system and then the string of what command you want to execute. Obviously, we want to get a shell on the system. So we're going to use the command forward slash bin forward slash sh. You could use like cat space flag dot txt if you wanted to, but just to make it easy, we want a shell. So we're going to do forward slash bin forward slash sh. So now, System's a, a function that exists in libc, and when the program runs, it's going to load libc into memory with the program. So system does exist inside memory whenever we run our um, vulnerable function, whether or not we use it or not. 
And you can tell that it's actually being loaded because if you were to run it in GDB and then set a breakpoint at main for whatever, and you just do print system to print the address of system, then you'd see it'll give you an actual address. Like as you can see, system is located at that hex 7FFF 7A address. And you can also do like print printf or print puts to print all of the addresses of the, uh, the functions that are in libc. So this is how, you know, if you're a C developer on Linux or an operating system, how doing this stuff is easier because you don't want to write the actual code that takes your input, does the right system calls to print it out, does the right formatting. You don't want to do that. Somebody else already did it for you. I'll just use their code. So what we can do is we can try to leak an address of libc to figure out, hey, when libc is loaded inside memory, what address is it actually loaded in? So if you were to type in the command vm or vm map in a GDB, what this will show you is this will show you the actual addresses that everything in RAM is loaded at. So if you look at the top, we have our actual binary. And as you see the start address, which is that hex 400000, you saw when we were looking for uh, memory protections that the binary had was no pi. And as and that every time the binary runs, it's gonna be loaded at that hex 400000 address. So we have our, our binary, then un right under that, we have starting at hex 7FFF, we have our libc. So that's the beginning of our libc. And then after that, we have the um, just the read writable page of memory. And after that, we have our linker. So our linker is also loaded into libc. And then after that, we have some more random pages of memory. We have VDSO, which is a whole other topic. We have another section of our linker that's loaded in. Then we have our stack. So as you can see, the start address of our actual stack is those addresses right there. <clears throat> so since the um, since with GDB, whenever you run a program, it's not run with ASLR by default. Those addresses are always going to be the same every time you run the program. However, if we were to run the program with ASLR, then the addresses are going to change. Not our binary addresses, like the vuln addresses, because the binary does not have pi, but the libc, the linker, the stack are all going to change. So if you were to uh, type in ASLR space on, to like say, hey, we want to we want to put ASLR on now instead of you know have it off, and then you're to run it again. On the binary again, or check the memory. You have to now. rerun it to, yep. yeah, remap, and then you, you do vm to view the. Uh, virtual memory, you can see the binary stays the same, but all of the uh, libc addresses are different and all of the linker addresses and the stack addresses are different. And if you run it again, do VM, you're different again. So we have to figure out, hey, how do we actually defeat ASLR, which this is what it's called, where it randomizes the address, address layout. So a thing with ASLR is even though the addresses are random, they're not completely random. So whenever you're calling a function, like let's say for um, in your program with ASLR, you wanted to call the, the vuln function, if you have a main function and a vuln function. Now, if ASLR is enabled in the binary or pi is enabled, let's just say hype, like for your binary, not this binary specifically, but just for your binary, how will it reference the vuln function if those addresses are random. It, Typically it need an offset, right? Yeah, it can't, it can't really do that. So with ASLR, it's not completely random in the sense that every time you run a binary and you wanted to find out how far away the system function is from the printf function, for example, it's always going to be the same. So you, you don't have to do this, but if you keep running the binary, printing system, printing printf, finding the difference, it's always gonna be the same because even though the actual load address of libc is, um, is different, the offsets for each function in libc are always gonna be the same. 
what this essentially allows us to do is if we leak any address in libc that we know we're le leaking like let's say we leak um let's say hypothetically we leak the printf function it doesn't matter we know we leak the printf function and we know we have that hex 7f whatever value we are able to calculate the system function we're able to calculate the puts function we're able to calculate all of these functions even though we leaked one value inside libc which is now you can see how memory leaks are very very valuable you don't have to leak all of these different function addresses you just have to leak one address and you have all of you know everything inside libc so how are we going to actually achieve this memory leak and this is where we get into sort of how your binary is able to interact with libc using the procedure linkage table and the global office offset table. So let's talk a little bit about, you know, how functions are being called in libc, <laughs> which is, it's not too complex. I know a lot of people hear global offset table, procedure linkage table and think, hey, this is, you know, crazy stuff. But if we go to Gidra, you can see. Sorry, I thought you were to keep chatting. I won't get to Gidra. <laughs> <laughs> If you go to uh, Ghidra, there's a, on the top left, you'll see the actual segments of memory. And you can see we have .bss, .data, .got, .plc, .dot, all those different sections. So let's say we were to call the scanf function. What would actually happen is we're going to call scanf inside of the PLC or the procedure linkage table. Now, if you double click on scanf and Gidra, it won't actually go to scanf and the, the PLT. It will go to another function. But if you go to the actual PLT segment inside the uh, program trees, the dot PLT, <clears throat> and if we were to search for scanf, there's puts um, set res GID, set, uh, set buff GID, there's our scanf. So whenever you do that call instruction, that call scanf, it will put the return address on the stack and it will jump to this address right here, which is the hex 400580, right there, yep. Now what this is doing is it's getting the value that's at scan up inside of the GOT or the global offset table. And that value can either be two things. Well, it gets that value and then it jumps to it. And that value can either be two things. It can either be the address of the next instruction, which would be the 400586, which is that push OX4, or it will be the value of actual scanf and libc. So whenever we were in GDB and we we're doing that P scanf or P system, it would be that value that's at that um, scanf global offset table area of memory. So if we were to go to the uh, .got, it's .got.plt section in Gidra, right there, yep. These are the actual, the sort of array of all of the um, libc addresses. So as you can see, scanf, what it will do is take the value that's at 601038, which is those, right now it's just about 302060, which it's gonna be different whenever the binary is running. But that, that value right there is either going to be the actual address of scanf and libc, or it's going to be that libc at plc plus six, which is that push four, whatever. So what we can do is we, since we have control of code execution, it, let's try to find some way that we can sort of just print that value out. So with the uh, functions that actually print stuff out that we have, you know, imported, which is puts, um, I don't know if we have printf. Yeah, we just have puts. So this is the, this is the only function we have that we know the address of, because we can just do like a call puts. And um, it, it will allow us to leak memory. So the way that puts works is puts will take a, take one argument, and that argument is a pointer to a string. So let's say hypothetically we were to call puts, but with a value 601038, which is our scanf in the global offset table. What it will then do is instead of printing, you know, 601038, it will print the value at 
60103 because put takes a pointer. So we'll actually print out the value of scanf inside of the, the global offset table, which will either be our real scanf address or the address of scanf at the PLC plus six, which is our push OX4. Awesome. Is there anything confusing about that? I know it's kind of, whenever you get into the global offset table and procedure linkage table, it can get pretty intense pretty quick. I tend to get confused on dot got on its own dot plt on its own and then dot got dot plt is dot is dot global offset table procedural linkage table is this the single source of truth is this where we tend to always go so it's really it's really the uh, dot got dot plt is where you pretty much always go okay because with the dot plt the dot plt contains actual like code instructions that are executable right and as you saw with nx whenever you have an executable segment of memory you can't write to it you can read from it but it's just going to be you know assembly opcodes so it's not going to it's just going to be pretty much gibberish but with the global offset table it's both writable because we have partial rel row we can also read from it. And the global author table contains all of the addresses of these functions inside libc. Awesome. But the PLT is what's actually being executed whenever you call it, but the values that are being jumped to after you execute the PLT are being, are pointing to libc. So it's gotcha. sort of like a jump, 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 like it's just jumping everywhere. Yeah. So now that we know that we have a value inside our binary where we know a libc address is going to exist, let's start trying to figure out a way to print it out. So this is where we get into the sort of like return, return oriented programming. Yeah. Which is a very, very cool technique. It, it's, it's, I mean, a lot of people like get into return or uh, ROP and they're like, oh, this is pretty cool. Like I can call these functions and everything. But when you really get like down to doing like very complex ROP and more advanced ROP, like you can, you could pretty much use ROP to make your own um, interpreter reverse shell. <laughs> it's just, it just gets so, whenever you get to the more advanced, like, oh, instead of just calling functions, you could just program your own program inside of an actual program. And it just, gets awesome. very, it just gets very mind-blowing. <laughs> but anyway, um, let's start trying to formulate a ROP chain, finding ROP gadgets. We'll talk about a little bit about what ROP gadgets are to try to leak that libc address. So in layman's term, what a ROP gadget actually is, is it's a sequence of instructions that end in a return instruction. That's just the, the basic layman's definition you have you know, more complex ROP chains. But in our case, it's just going to be, hey, any set of instructions that end in a return instruction. So how do we go searching for these um, set of instructions that end in a return instruction? We can just manually go through it in Ghidra, but there's also tools that exist. Um, one of them is called Ropper. One of them is called Rop Gadget. Um, I believe that Rop Gadget comes with pwn tools. So it's just Rop Gadget. And then it's going to be ROP gadget dash dash binary. It's going to be our vuln. Now you can see here's all of the <clears throat> all of the uh, gadgets we can use. So these are a set of assembly instructions. There are some that ends in like jumps and everything, but in our case, those aren't going to be very useful. But it's pretty much all these instructions that just end in ret and jump and all of these different things. So for the actual ROP gadgets we're going to need, we're going to need a ROP gadget that lets us control the first argument of a function call. Because as you saw, in order to leak that scanf address, we're going to need to do puts and then the address of scanf in the global offset table. So whenever you get to like the assembly, assembly the first argument of a function call is going to be in the RDI register. You can um, Google the actual, it's called um, x86-64 calling conventions. 
and it'll tell you, hey, whenever you call a function, this um, RDI needs to be in the first argument, RSI needs to be in the second argument, RDX, and then it just keeps going. There's a big list. Then after you fill up the registers, you start putting values on the stack. But all we care about is RDI because, we, because puts only takes one argument. Am I calling that right? X64 calling conventions? Yeah. yeah. Yep. Yeah, there should be a Wikipedia x86 calling conventions. This contains like a whole list at the bottom of It'll tell you like the historical background. There's so many different types of calling conventions. Um, but that essentially what calling conventions do is just, it's sort of a standard to say, hey, whenever a computer is passing arguments to a function call, this is how you should do it. You don't have to do it, but this is how they're gonna do it. Like for, for our case, we're using, we're on x86-64 and we use the GCC compiler. So it's gonna be the system V, yep, right there. And there's our argument list. So RDI is the first, RSI, RDX, RCX, R8, R9, and it gets to the MMO, MM0 and through seven registers, which we don't really worry about. That's if you wanna pass like floating point values and everything. But after R9, parameters are just gonna be put on the stack. So if you have 10 arguments in a function call, it's going to be those registers, then the rest are going to be put on the stack. <clears throat> so there's the calling conventions. We have to find some way now of putting that value inside RDI. So this is where our wrap gadgets come into play. We want to find some gadget that modifies RDI, whether it be like a move something RDI or a uh, pop RDI. Ideally, a pop RDI, it will make it easier but essentially something that will just modify RDI. So if you look, we got pop R12, R15, RVP, and there, there's the pop RDI. <clears throat> so what we wanna do now is at the end of our exploit, we wanna call this pop RDI. So this will allow us to then edit whatever is in the RDI register. Just save that address. Yep, pop RDI. <clears throat> and there we go. Easy enough. Easy enough. Yep. <clears throat> so, what the pop instruction will do is it'll take whatever's on the stack and put it in that register. Since our buffer overflow has control of the stack, after that instruction, we're then going to have to pass the value, put the value we want to put in RDI. So you have our pop RDI, then whatever value you want to put. So we want to put that, yeah, that's, that's 6010, that hex 0060. So we can just call this scanf at the GOT. Cool. So what's going to happen is it's going to execute that pop RDI instruction. Then it's going to put that 601038 inside the RDI register. Then after we do that, it's going to hit a red instruction, which means, hey, we're at a red instruction. It's going to still look at the stack for what value you want to jump to. So we got to put another value that we want to jump to. <clears throat> so this is where we need to call the puts function. And the way we can call the puts function is how like your program calls the puts function what it will actually do is it will actually jump to the puts at PLT instruction or address. So if we go back into Ghidra, go to the uh, PLT, look for puts, and we can see that there's our puts right there. If we just jump to the hex 400540, that's essentially we're calling puts. So we can just call it like puts at PLT. Cool. All right, we got we got those. 
constants sorted out. So let's start actually building this ROP chain. So for this ROP chain, we'll get to, we'll get to the packing soon. Am I going ahead of you? I mean, if, if you want to, yeah, it would probably be, it would probably be good to uh, just pack the values whenever you're storing them in variables. It's just up to you, whatever you personally like. But um, in this case, since we're working with a 64-bit binary, we're gonna have to Ooh, use P64. You're totally right. Okay. So if you, yeah, if you just wanna leave that. Um, do you tend to do it like after you've built your chain or do you do it for the variables? How do you usually do it? So what I actually do is um, Pwn Tools is pretty much more black magic than GDB. <laughs> but um, essentially with Pwn Tools, you can automate the whole finding of addresses, which I'll get to after we do it manually. Cause it's always good to know how to do it manually before yeah. you actually automate everything. Cause if you automate it and you're stuck in a situation where you can't automate it, then, oh, well, but yeah. if you know how to do it manually and, and automate it, it's, it's better in the long run. So that's what I generally do is I just, you know, use Pwn Tools magic to find the addresses, which nice. we can get to after. But um, in this case, let's just uh, leave it how it is. We'll do the packing inside of our actual payload ROP chain. So the first thing we're gonna need is we're gonna need our, <clears throat> what I like to do is just make a variable called payload. This makes it easier building a ROP chain. Then the first thing we need is our junk, which is our A's up until the Then after our junk, we first need to call the pop RDI to edit to fill the RDI uh, register, which is going to have to be the P64. So we're going to get a packet. Then after that, we're going to do the uh, scanf at the global offset table, because that's the address we want to actually leak. And then we're going to do the puts at PLT, which is the call puts. Is that fair? Yep, that, that's good. So now that we call puts at PLT, after that function ends, it's still expecting a value on the stack to jump to. So we're gonna have to put another value on the stack that we want to jump to. So if we just leave it blank, the program's gonna crash. We don't want that. We wanna have the value leak, but also control it. So just for simplicity's sake, let's just jump back to main. Act as if, you know, this is some just jump back to main. So if we go back to the binary in Gidra, go to main. <clears throat> I need to scroll down. Yep, there's our address of main. That's all we need. Yep, so we're gonna P64 again, but <clears throat> So what this is doing is this will make this makes it so that after we leak the address, we just go back to main, act as if the program just started back up again, so it doesn't crash. Gotcha. Now after that, we have to we have the payload constructed. Now we just have to send it to the binary. So we're going to do p dot sunline. Or you can. Yeah. I'm going to bring this all together because I tried <clears> to separate it a bit. And then we'll take that process and send it. Yep. So now we're actually going to send our payload to the binary. So cool. Let's try running that. All right. Okay. Now you can see. It printed our A's and I printed some rant, some weird values. So what those values are is it's the address of scanf in libc. However, it's trying to print it as ASCII. And if you look at the ASCII table, like hex 7f isn't an actual, you know, printable character. So it's just gonna print it like that backslash X. It's gonna try to print it out, but it can't. So now we have this memory leak. 
how do we actually programmatically use it, use it to our advantage? So back in the uh, Pwn tool script, let's try seeing if we can just put that in our script and store it in a variable. So let's make a leak variable and then say it's just p.receive line. So just say, hey, receive a line of input and store it in the leak variable. Then after we do that, under there, we can do log.info. So we want to print something out. And we're going to have to use an f string here. Then just print out leak. Just going to put in our uh, yep, curly brackets. So we can print out the leak variable. Uh, there's a cool trick you can do with f strings, like having an equal sign right before it. Yeah, I think, you, right? you can you can do that. I mean, it's up to you. <laughs> we're not printing out anything else, so we know that one value that we leak is going to be the yep. value we want. But I'm going to yeah. do that just so it um, doesn't like me. Is it the other way around? I think I, it's the other way. Yeah. That will there you go. typically display. So it should be up on the top. Oh, you're right. Thank you. Good call. The reason I like using leak or log.info instead of print is because with print, it doesn't put any identifiers. So you might actually mix it up with the actual program output, which makes it harder to see. But if we do log.info, it prefixes the string with that curly brace or that square brace star, which makes it easier to identify. Now, I notice we're only grabbing that first banner. Yes. So we need to do another p.receive line. Because instead of grabbing the first banner, let's grab the, uh, let's try seeing if, hey, if we were to receive the next line, if that'll actually print out our leak. And as you can see, nope, it just prints out our input. So we're another receive line. Let's try doing it again. And then there we go. Much better. Now we just have a new line at the end. Yep. So now we have to actually format it into something that we can use. So the first thing we have to strip the new line. So that strips the new line. So now that we strip the new line, um, if you look at our leak again, it will just be the actual value without the new line, which is what we want. Just the raw value and it's asking for. So now what we actually have to do is, this is actually in a bytes format and we want it in an integer format. So we have to unpack it. You saw how with our P64s, we were packing the integers into bytes. Now we have to take the bytes and unpack it into an integer. So we have to do a U64. But the thing with um, U64 and U32 and all those is they expect that the string is actually however many bits you're specifying. So for U64, it's expecting, hey, this string is four bytes or eight bytes. And then if you look, we're going to say, hey, unpack requires a buffer of eight bytes. So what we can do is we can just <clears throat> safely prefix it. In this case, this little ending is actually going to be the suffix of it, but with null bytes. So what we can use is the um, function ljust, or the method dot ljust, which means, hey, we want to adjust the string, pad it with some bytes in front of it. And we're going to do eight, which is the uh, size. So we want to say, hey, we want this string to be eight bytes now. And we're going to prefix it with null bytes. Or in this case, since it's little endian, make it the suffix. OK. So then if we run it and unpack it, we have that big decimal value. If you want to print it out as hex, you'll see it actually looks like a hex 7f blah, blah, blah value. Well, I wonder if it'll let me do that nicely with the equal sign there. I think it will. Yep. Yeah, OK. So yeah, there's our, there's our leaked value. So now what we can do is we can store that in a very, we can, um, we already stored it in the leak variable, so it's fine. But we have our set buff. The actual set buff, or not set buff, sorry, scanf inside libc. Awesome. So, okay, so we got scanf inside libc. Now, what we need to do is we need to calculate the offset between scanf and the function we want to call, which is system.
Okay. So there's two ways you can do this. Um, you can either do some algebra to find the difference between scanf and system, figure out that offset, and then take that leak minus the offset, you find system. Or you can um, just play it safe and say, hey, let's just find the base address of libc so it makes calculating offsets easier. This way, if we, if in the future we want to call other functions except for system, we're able to more, we're able to easier. We already found the base address of libc. We just have to find offsets of that base address. We don't have to actually calculate the difference. Gotcha. So what we have to do now is we have to find the actual address of system of scanf in uh, our libc that isn't the real address loaded in, but the actual address in the binary itself. So you can either load libc and gidra and analyze it, but that will probably take, you know, a good two to three minutes inside <laughs> a VM. Or you can just use readelf. Readelf is another program that will uh, print out the symbols of, of a binary. So if we do readelf, it'll print out everything, but we would just want the symbols, so we're going to do dash s. And here's all of the, all of the libc symbols. We only care about scanf, so let's just grab for scanf because it's going to take a while to search for all of that. So there we go. Now a lot easier to search. So there's our scanf, and we see it's 7b0b0. So if we take our leaked value, subtract that 7b0b0, then we have found the actual load address of libc the actual base address, which will make calculating other offsets a lot easier. Is that fair? Yep. Cool. So now what we can use is we can use that base address of libc to calculate the address of other functions. And the function that we need to calculate the address of is system. So we can use that read elf again to find yep. kind of the offset, right? Yep. So there you go. We got that 4f, 4e, 0. So now if we do the base address of libc plus that 4f, we have the actual physical in-memory address of system. Awesome. All right, cool. So we have the address of system. There's one thing that we're missing, and that thing is the actual bin sh string, yeah. forward slash bin forward slash sh. So what you can do is you can just say, hey, why don't we try to like read in, put bin sh into our payload, use that, whatever. But fortunately with us, the way system actually works is it calls exec l forward slash bin forward slash sh and then your command hmm. so the bin sh string has to exist inside libc in order for a system to work so we know that the bin sh string is in libc let's try finding it and to prove that you know it's actually in libc you can just run strings libc and then grep for bin sh <clears throat> there we go and you can see it actually returns successfully. Now to actually find the, now we have to actually find the address of the bin sh in libc. So this is where we're gonna have to get out Gidra and open up libc. Fortunately for us, we don't have to analyze it. <clears throat> we can just open it up and search memory. So it's not gonna take, you know, three minutes to analyze. And for analysis, just click no, <clears throat> click OK. Now we're going to have to search the memory. So you can either go up in the top to uh, search, or you can just press S. <clears throat> now for the format, we want to find a string. We don't want to find a hexadecimal sequence. So we're going to click string for format. My virtual machine is getting annoying on trying to move windows, <laughs> on, on clicking on things. All right. And then just 
been a thick. Nice. Search all. And there we go. We have that right there. So if we click on that, then you can exit out of those windows. And then okay. cool, you can see we have that, that bin SH and we have the address of it. So there's the address of bin SH. 2B40FA, right? Uh, yep, 2B40FA. Now that's going to be from the base address of libc, correct? Yep. yep. <clears throat> cool. Okay. So we have everything we need to do an actual red to libc. We have our address of system. We have our bin SH string address. Sweet. And the other thing is the program jumped back to main and now it's ready for us to receive input. So this is where we construct our second ROP chain, but instead of doing the pop RDI scanf and everything to leak with C, we're just gonna do pop RDI that bin SH address and then the address of libc. And we're also gonna have to pack that piece of yep. four. Thank you. So since we kind of cruise through that, I'll offer some other uh, top coverage. We'll use junk to uh, again, get back to the offset where we know our instructor pointer will end up going because uh, of the buffer overflow. Uh, we'll use pop RDI to supply an argument to a function that we're going to end up calling. Uh, and bin sh address is just going to be the string for bin sh. Uh, and we're giving that to system. So system is going to end up being the function that we call. But before we call it, thanks to ROP, we just do need to prepare that address. And that's why we use RDI and get that address that we just determined with some ret to libc math mm -hmm. cool then we can just prepare that payload i think yep Pay prepare that payload send it off wow and all looks good i think now that will call system and system will kind of block because we'll just interact with it Yep. So we're we're done. <laughs> yep. So let's try try running it. See what happens. Moment of truth. I failed. So we got pop RDI oh. we've done previously. Let's Been see a the, uh, error. Expected a, a bite like, like object. We got an int. It might be because you're trying to overwrite. Oh yeah, you did p dot join dot dot join payload, but it should be second. Oh, you're totally right. Payload. Thank you so much. There. That's why you shouldn't change your variable names. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. Oh, we got an end of file. Oh. Not what we wanted. What like the heck? Patient's fault. So now we're going to get into the fun stuff. Try to debug our ROP chain. Yeah. So fortunately for us, Pwn tools makes it very easy. What we can do is after our P equals process, we can do a GDB dot attach and then P. So what this will do is this will run our binary, but then attach GDB immediately after. All right. Now, since you're using a terminator, you might need to do a little funky stuff. So uh, at the top of the uh, pwn tool script, you're going to need a context. Oh, it actually did it. Yeah, I wanted to check, but it looks like it, it behaves OK. Yeah. All right. So now let's just um, set a breakpoint at do stuff. 
or let's go to um it's not a breakpoint at do stuff let's go back to gidra find out where the uh do stuff return is like the return instruction it's up on the uh if you go back to gidra oh you're right top left yep you just x out of libc yeah great so let's go to do stuff search for do stuff i hate when my vm does this <laughs> All right. And then click on that return. Then you can see it's at that hex 00400770 right there. Yep. So copy that address. Oh, is it just acting up? Are you, yeah. All right. So it's just going to be B star OX 40. What was it? Zero zero seven seven zero. Fair. Yep. Cool. And I do C for continue. So we're reaching our. This is our first ROP chain that's going to leak. We have the pop RDI rep. So if you just do SI, enter, and now go to the pop RDI rep. Just press enter again because GDB will. If you just press enter in GDB, it will run whatever previous command ran. Then we get to the ret, then we do actual puts. We don't care about this stuff. It's just gonna go execute puts inside of libc. So we can just continue. Um, yeah, just continue. Uh, I'm still sting single stepping. Yeah, you need to C for- C for continue? continue? Yep. Our breakpoint will still hit it? Yeah, okay. So now we're at the pop RDI, so SI. Pop RDI, let's see. Now let's examine to see what's RDI. So do X uh, four, yep, that works. X four slash GX. And as you can see, something's wrong. Mm. So let's try to figure out what, what went wrong here. So uh, quit out of that. All good in GIF. Yep, Q. Okay. There you go. <laughs> so now if we go back to our console scripts. So what we can do to uh, debug this is <clears throat> let's, this is very common with ROP chains about having to debug them because something happens. You type in a bunch of code and you're like, all right, I'm so excited. And it just seg faults. Yep. Very, very typical. So the first thing we should do is check to see if our leak worked. Okay. So what we can do under the uh, log.info for the leak is check to see, hey, do we actually calculate the base address right? Is that all we need? Just to check to see the contents? Yep. Okay. Should be it. Let's just try running it. You can X uh, Yeah. Hmm. So now we can see what our issue is. We didn't we didn't leak libc right. Because with libc, whenever you load a library in memory, the last four nibbles or the last hex hex digits should be zero but there is yeah. zero. So we could figure out why this didn't work by figuring out like, hey, is the scanf right and everything? Or we can just pick another address to leak. Um, it's up to you. Um, if you just want to figure out the scanf one, you can figure out the scanf one. So what we're going to have to do is we're going to have to run it with GDB, figure out, hey, are we leaking scanf right? Pretty much just you know the whole debugging shebang of let's try let's try figuring out what's happening because something doesn't seem right. Okay. So if we run it, open up our debugger, set a breakpoint. Let's just set a breakpoint at main. Make it easy. So just do B and then main, and then continue. Now let's go back to our other screen to see what leaks we got. So let's copy that 
that scan up one, which is the hex leak. So now if we print it, it should say scanf. And it doesn't. Well, hmm. if you if you do examine, you might have to examine this. So just, yeah. So okay. yeah, it, it is scanf. So we got our scanf, but our leak's not right. So now we know that, hey, we're getting the actual leak. It's scanf, but our base address is wrong. Just through like trial and error or like analysis, we can figure, hey, is this constant we're subtracting out the right constant? Oh. So if you look, our scanf is actually going to underscore underscore ISO C99 scanf, not scanf itself. Right. So there's the there's our issue. So let's try searching for the ISO C99 scanf in the binary with readelf instead of scanf itself. Okay. Just trying to just debugging, figure out, hey, what's wrong? Yeah, this is good. This is this is a good process. It's probably because... going to be in the libc instead of the oh, binary itself. You are totally right. I'm sorry. Libc. And then grep. Yep. Uh, just do, yeah. Just do um, scanf. Yeah, it might be truncating it in some weird ways. Yeah. Maybe. I'm guessing it is truncating it. So uh, um, you might do a uh, just pipe it pipe it to less so we can search search for it interactively. Sure. Make it easier. Just try to search for like two underscores. Probably gonna be. Two underscores. Oh dear God. <laughs> Do we have any two underscores I maybe? Because it's, it's two underscores I S O C. Is Nan ISO? I'm guessing um you could you could type uh N to go to the next occurrence. Sure. And then capital N will go to the previous occurrence. So we have some ISOs. So obviously you can see, you know, scanf's not a good function to leak because it's, it's getting pretty difficult to find the actual offsets. Luckily, with the way that the global offset table is structured, scanf isn't the only function we can use to leak. We can also like leak puts. It's uh, the our only limitations for address leaking in this way is whatever's in the .got.plt. I'll get there eventually. <laughs> okay. So our, our only limitations for this is whatever is in here. So, so I think it's, puts is a fine option. Puts is a fine option. Let's try puts. So let's go through the same thing. We put the put that got, then the put that so, we don't need to put that PLT. So it, yep, that six zero one zero one eight. You can just change the constants if you want. Yeah. Okay. Even though it says scan it's actually going to be well, finding, finding a replace. Yeah. Great. We don't need to do the PLT, just the got. But we also need to find do the offset, the scan up offset. So let's go read elf and then puts. Uh, there we go. That looks much more accurate. Yep. 80830. Is it eight zero eight three zero or um eight zero eight three zero? I think that might be an issue with it. I think it. Sh I think it should be fine. It should be fine. Guess we'll find out. Yep. We'll run into another wall. What did you have in mind? What were you, when you were thinking? Uh... So, our. If you saw our buffer overflow would receive input until a new line. And right. the line character in hexadecimal is zero A. Ooh. However, since with libc addresses, the only thing that's going to be the same is the last three nibbles. So that's going to be the A30. So that that's zero A 
might be like 1A, it might be 2A, it might be 3A, just depends on ASLR. That's true. But if it ended, like let's say it ended in 0A, 0A. Yeah, that'd be bad. <laughs> that would cause some issues. Okay. Well. And it's also the same, like let's say if we just did scan F percent S, scan F percent S won't read in the white space character or hexadecimal two zero. So if you're trying to leak an address that had a zero X two zero in it, or your ROP chain contained a zero X two zero, that's not gonna work. And it's very difficult to debug those types of issues because you're like, hey, I have all this stuff laid out. My code's correct. Why isn't this working? And it's yeah. because There's the a way bad your program somewhere. was receiving an input. Cool. Let's try this. The debugger can go. We can step. Do you want to step through this or should uh, we just let it cruise? Continue. Cool. Oh, we got another seg fault, it looks like. Let's mm. just press, press LS. Just type LS. My, nope. So it looks like we got another seg fault. Let's, let's see why it occurs. This is the old GDB. This is the new one. So let's see. We have return. Let's see without our stack. RSP is now pointing to. Oh, sorry. Yeah, it's pointing to a junk garbage value. Try to figure out what's up there. So let's go back to um, my assumption is um, that there. Are, what I what I predicted how we had that new line character inside of our yeah. chain. That's, that's my assumption just based on seeing this, but it could be something else. Let's try one that isn't as risky, I guess. You could try, I think I used set buff when I solved this. Yeah, let's use set buff. Yeah. But as you can see, like just looking at GDB, if you weren't aware of that whole new line thing, it can be very difficult to debug that because you just see a junk value and you're like, wait, hold on a second. This should be my value that I put there. Six zero one zero two eight for set buff. Uh, two zero. Oh, two zero. Yep. Or yep. Yeah, two eight. Sorry. Yeah. No, you're good. That res. That should be set buff. Okay. And then we can get the set buff offset. Cool. 88540, much better. That seems better. Yep. Let's try it again. We can let the debugger go. All right. Oh, uh, looks like our leak went a little bit, a little bit wonky. A little, little weird numbers. Let's try running it again. Did it? Huh. Yeah. If you look at the leak, it doesn't start with seven F. Oh, good call. So try running it again. Continue. That's better. Seven F. How did you see look? Now we're uh, running into it. Another issue. So let's see what this issue is. Um, so we have RSP is pointing to there. And so let's try to find our actual payload, our A's that we entered. Gotcha. So we can use, we can use a uh, Jeff function called telescope. So telescope will, it allows you to like pretty print memory. Hmm. Telescope dollar sign RSP. Let's just do minus um, thirty-two. Uh, oh, you you can't. You have to. Uh, you can't put spaces between the. Oh. Uh, yeah. I'm glad you know that. <laughs> there you go. So yeah, okay. there's our there's our pretty print. You can see our RSP value. Now RSP should be our address of um, 
address of pop RDI, but it's obviously not. Um, our payload's overflowing. So let's go back to the pwn tool script. It's like there's some issues there. So we have our junk. Let's look at the first payload. See what the first sure. Is. Junk, pop RDI. GPT. That looks correct. Now let's go to our second payload. That looks correct. Do we need something else sane to jump back to after this? You shouldn't need it because system will fork. Yeah. Um All right, let's try stepping through it again. Okay. So set a uh, breakpoint at the do stuff. At the, so we're going to set two breakpoints this time. We're going to set a breakpoint at do stuff. And we're also going to set another breakpoint at do stuff return address because we want to see what's the layout of the stack before we enter our input and what's the layout after to make sure there's no like funny business going on. All right. So you said we want one at do stuff. Yep. And another now, do uh you can do um disassemble and then do stuff. Do stuff. Now to make this easy, we can just do yep, you can type that in. Yep, D star OX. There you go. All right, now if we do C for continue, this is our ROP chain that's gonna leak. So if we just do SI, we can step into it. To step into it, make sure it does everything correctly. So RDI. So now we're, we're at puts. Let's, well, step again. Yep. And then now we're jumping to uh, puts. So let's see if RDI contains the actual value we expect it. And if you see at the top, RDI is <clears throat> there. So it prints set buff, which is correct. So let's continue. Now, just for a sanity check, let's go back to see if the leak is actually processed in our pwn tool scripts. So yeah, that looks all sane, but it'd be good to double check those addresses. Oh, should we double check this? It'd be good to just double check. Yeah. Set buff. Good. And that. All right, that, that's not gonna um, display correctly because it's the there's no symbol associated. Yeah, the base address kind of just won't know. Yeah, the base address is just there. <clears throat> but it looks right. You can check it with a VM map if you want to, but it looks it looks sane. Um let's let's just try a VM map. Yep. So yep, it's that 7F7D 10132 C0 7F7D. Yeah. Map. Perfect. Great. Okay. So that's okay. Now let's um, let's see if our system address is actually correct. So let's do print system. Now let's do let's try to find the we we don't know we I didn't print out the system address right. But since GDB will let us do some you know basic arithmetic, we can do p and then system minus the base address of load c to find that constant. So it's OX4F4E0. So let's look it up in the script to see if that's right. 4F4E0, cool. That's correct. So everything looks great. Let's just uh, keep stepping through it. So let's so step until you get to do a. Uh, Other continue, I think. Well, not to continue, do um, NI, which is next instruction, but it won't go into call. Like whenever there's a call, it won't step into the call. It'll just step over. Okay. So let's go right before it calls scanf, which will receive our input. So here we have the scanf, and we have RSI, which is our string that we want to actually scan in. So now what we want to do is, um, so if you look at the bottom, you have the scanf.pat, it'll just print out RDI and RSI. So we oh, know awesome. that 
that R string is going to be contained at whatever RSI is pointing to. So it'd be, let's just try copying the RSI value. All right. Now let's do NI to step over to scanf. So it just receives our input. Now let's do telescope again. And let's do that value that we had. The uh, yep. So as you can see, telescope didn't print enough. So if we do telescope space, and let's just say we want to print 64 instead of the default. You might need to scroll up a little bit. So there we have our input, input, input. Okay. RBP right there. So we'll pop RBP. Now after we have that, we have the pop REI. But the pop REI is pointing. So as you can see, what it should show after the pop RDI <clears throat> is it should show our bin SH. But mm. it doesn't show our bin SH. So that tells us that our bin SH is wrong. Now, what we can do in um, GDB is you can actually search memory, which is very convenient. Or uh, Jeff. Yeah. So I believe it's search and then um, it takes like a start address and an end address and then whatever string you want to search. Um, so let's get the beginning and end of libc. Well, that's, that's the beginning and end of the first segment of libc. You want all oh. of libc. So it's going to be all the way down, right? Yes. Cool. Good catch. And bin sh? Yep. Can't find default source file. <clears throat> you might have to wrap it in quotes. Or mm, quotes. Which part? Or, I keep on forgetting the syntax. That's for all right. This. Um, Maybe you don't even need to search pattern or just grep. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty awesome. Okay, grep. Oh, there we go. So Wait. the address of libc or bin sh you can see is, <clears throat> oh, that's actually great. I didn't know about grep, but um, it's actually the 7f 7D114E. That's actually a pointer to a pointer that's pointing to the NSH. You know, you got pointers and stuff. Now, okay. that address has a null byte in it, and that scares me. <laughs> well, the thing about that is that's a uh, pointer to a pointer. We want the uh, 7F7D114E one, uh, 0101. Okay. Because then if we just do like, uh, print and then that value, you'll see it's actually, you don't have to do a minus, just print. Or do uh, examine S, sorry. Oh, that's not been SH. Um, I think it's two. It's it's uh, this address to that address. Try, yeah, try printing it out. There we go. Yeah, so that's yeah. it. So that now, null byte still spooks me. Even Yeah, the, the null byte still spooks you. However, our ROP chain has had null bytes since the first one. Ah. Because with the scan of, as I said, it scanned until a new line. Ah. Not a new line or a null byte. So now if we see it's that 7F, um, 7D, let's try to find the offset. See if yeah. the offset's right. Yeah. Uh, oh, dear God. So it's 1D40FA. Now let's go back to our pwn tool script, see if that's it. <clears throat> and no, it is not. So there's our issue. I had a typo. <laughs> we found we found the bug. Are you telling me that I mistyped <laughs> something <laughs> vitally important? Cool. As you, can, as you can see how we tracked down that bug just by do with some sanity checks. Yeah. Okay. Well, it's, it's, it's very, it's pretty difficult, you know, if you're not, if you're not used to 
solving these challenges using GDB, yeah. like just stepping through with GDB, you can see how you get a segfault and you have no idea why it's segfaulting. Yeah. But now that we did some sanity checks in GDB and printed out some values, we could easily just track down. So that's why debuggers are very important when doing these challenges. The GDB is definitely absolutely critical here. It's yeah. very, yeah, it's very, a lot of people don't realize. They'll just try to like write it, look at the uh, disassembly, write it. See what, it didn't work. <laughs> try something else, didn't yeah. work, try something else. Even though, as you saw, you just put a two instead of a one. Yeah. So let's try it. And we can just continue here. Yep, let's let the debugger go. Now let's just try doing LS. I'm still tripping over something. <laughs> All right, let's try um, setting a breakpoint at um, the, the do stuff return again. So you can do disassemble do stuff. So set a breakpoint right there. Yep. B star OX. Continue. So this is our leak ROP chain, we can continue. Okay. So now here we go, moment of truth. So if we SI, all right, we have our bin SH on the stack. And if we SI, we pop it in. Then we have our RET SI. Now let's see what's in RDI. RDI is the actual address of libc. And you're gonna love this, you wanna know why? What's up? The reason is seg faulting is because libc is using our systems linker. What? So it, it, your exploit works, <laughs> but the problem is system is seg faulting itself because it's trying to use the systems linker, which is too new for the libc. So that's why you're getting that seg fault. So if you, I'm pretty positive if you run this against the remote, it will work. Uh, it might, you might actually, um, there might be an issue. You can try running it to a remote, which is the the guy who does bin X or anybody who does bin X is always this issue, but try running a remote. If you get the a shell good to get into the file, then you got that issue, which is. Our good friend stack alignment. Our good friend stack alignment. Yeah, yeah. The file. So we have stack alignment, which I'm guessing because it's, it's always stack alignment. It's always. <laughs> so okay. quick, quick fix. Just go into. Uh, you can either use Rop Gadget. You can go into Gidra. Just search for any return instruction. Just oh, right. nice and easy. Yep. Let's uh, let's do Rop Gadget again. That's um, uh, you got to use that's that's binary. binary. And I am going to grep for a colon and a ret. So I know that's the very, very first thing. There you go. So this guy looks pretty good. 40052E. This is going to go before the system. Yep. So before the system, put your P64. Uh, P64. Oh, thank you. We're uh, six bit architecture now. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Right, let's try that. Now, the reason that this works is because we are still doing ROP. All we've done is we've just so used our pop done... RDI to get that into the argument. RET will just do nothing but let us continue on to the next. Call. So here's so stack alignment. Let's talk a little bit about like what stack alignment actually is and why we put a red instruction there. Yeah. So with um more modern Ubuntu libc's, I believe it's like 2.27 and up. Um the libc will actually have certain instructions that will um require that the stack pointer be 16 byte aligned, meaning that the stack pointer is last hex digit is zero. And if that digit is not zero, 
then it will seg fault just based on how those instructions operate. Okay. So what we're doing when we do that write instruction, a return instruction will pop something off of the stack, which will then change that stack pointer from the last byte being, or the last nibble being a zero or an eight. Because pop will just take whatever's on the stack, increment RSP, I believe, yeah, increment RSP by eight, which will now, you know, instead of it being eight, it will now be zero when we reach that instruction that requires that the stack be aligned. Cool. Let's do it. I think if, that, if that's confusing, I can try to phrase it better, but. In, in my mind, it always seems like, okay, adding a little bit of padding. So things become back to normal. In this case, we're just padding with more instructions like a return. <laughs> Is that fair to say? I mean, it's not padding in the sense of a not flood. Right. It's more of just, <clears throat> it's more of just a nuisance than anything. Um, yeah. <laughs> but uh, it's just that it's, it's more of a nuisance. Um, you're just trying to make it so that whenever you call a system function, the last hex digit is a zero. And the way you can do that, you can use pop instructions, you can use red instructions, pretty much any value that just edits that RSP register. Okay. In this case, we're going simple with just putting a red instruction. Right. Okay. All right. Well, let's try this thing. So I think we're good. Yep. Let's go bold and not attach the debugger. Well, as you saw with um, the linker issues, it's not going to work locally. Is is it? Are we positive it is a linker issue? Um. Yeah. <laughs> oh wait, you ran it locally. It might not be a linker issue. I think it really was just stack alignment because I'm always in the same. I'm, I'm in 2004. Been. Yeah, when I saw it, um, when I saw it segfault, I didn't see any things in the instruction pointer that pointed to stack alignment. But hmm. what do you look out for when you are trying to look when you when you said something that would point to stack alignment? So what points to stack alignment is <clears throat> you seg fault on an instruction that is like a move at instruction. There's, I forget what the, it's called, but there's CPUs have, you know, your regular move, pop and everything instructions, but they also have like stuff like move ats. They have x86 is the complex, you know, architecture, but, um, like in, in this, you don't have any move apps. You just have basic assembly instructions that don't care about the, uh, the stack pointer. But in libc, specifically system, also printf, um, there are these instructions that exist. Um, I'm trying to find the correct term for these instructions. Well, yeah, that's essentially what it is. Okay. Certain instructions just, you might find it if you just step through system. Okay. I'll jump to system. I'm not taking. It. Yeah, just reason. do. SI, then you keep going. Move, move. All of these are fine. All of these work. Rep stos, that's fine. That's gonna probably take a while to execute. Oh geez. Yeah. I could do NI still or no? Uh you might be able to do NI. Oh. Maybe not. No. Um all right, that's fine. <laughs> yeah. We made it through. Wow, GEF is so awesome. Yeah, that's <laughs> it. The uh, compare exchange, I'm pretty sure that's one of a, uh, that's an instruction that needs an aligned stack. Mm. I think. I'm not positive though. But I, I know for a fact, move apps, you need an aligned stack. It's a, uh, do, do, do. See what type of instructions these are. There's a move DQ. There it is, move DQ. You see how it has the uh, X, X, MM zero? Yeah. 
that requires the uh, stack to be aligned. Ah. Mm -hmm. Just because of XMM0? Yeah, because you're, you're using those XMM, XMM registers. And those are the ones that are like based off the stack? It's not so. What it really is, is um, they're registers that are designed to hold floating, floating point values. Okay. So what they do is they take your integer value, but they do some conversions and store it into a floating point register. And with the way that works, since floating point registers are very weird, like the whole, the whole conversions and stuff, it just requires that the stack be aligned. Cool. So this is our exploit. And that should run remote. Hey. There we go. All right. Cool. So after a decent amount of time. <laughs> and debugging. We did it with yep. a bare bone basics baby ret to libc attack. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, it's a... It's a baby red to libc. Um, you get people who've been doing this for a while. They could solve it without even debugging. Just write a script and solve it. Um, I know a guy who actually wrote a tool which will automatically solve red to libc challenges. Oh my gosh! You just give it a binary in libc, and if you're feeling feeling lucky, you also give it the IP and port, and it will give you the flag. <laughs> That's awesome. Because it, it's just it's a basic challenge, but the thing about red to libc is it's good to go very into detail about how everything works, why we're using the GOT to leak addresses, why the GOT actually contains libc addresses, because it's part of that stuff is very foundational when it comes to more advanced stuff, like more advanced drop chains, um, poor matching vulnerabilities, even some heap exploitation. Just being aware of how your person, your binary that you create interacts with libc it's just very important to understand. Like, as, as I said, you know, people who have been doing this for a long time, they can just look at the binary and then just write the script. Yeah. And solve it. Cause it's, crank just, it up. Yeah, cause it's, a, it's a basic challenge. People do it a bunch, but it's really great to have that foundational knowledge of, as I just mentioned, whenever it comes to the more advanced stuff. Well, sweet. So it may seem like, you know, a basic challenge, but we, and we went to a lot of detail. Yeah, definitely. But it's just good to have that detail. Cool. Well, hey, that was awesome. Thanks so much for, for walking through all that. Mm -hmm. uh, I realized we, we took our sweet time with that one. So I think we, we definitely don't need to do any more today. <laughs> I mean, if, if you want, we can, I mean, as I said, like, I'm on break. Yeah. Like, I got nothing going on. Like, it, it's just up to you. I yeah. mean, I can show you how I'd solve this using a bunch of pwn tools foo if you want. Ooh. We could yeah. Go, we could do another challenge, is up to you. Are you in a spot to do a little bit of a, a demo and you can just like rapid fire cruise through however you had solved this just yeah, to showcase totally. it? Yep. I'm going to stop recording just to have a different video file for that. And also, as I said, like if the whole walking you through it didn't work out, I can just walk through it myself. I mean, that was like two and a half hours of pretty exceptional uh, knowledge. So I yeah, would like- Yeah, that's, that's what I wanted to like do is just spread knowledge, not just solve <laughs> the challenge. Yeah. A lot of these write-ups you see, they're just solving the challenges. They're not spreading the knowledge. Yeah. Like if you, like a lot of challenges don't mention the stack alignment. A yeah. Lot of challenges don't mention debugging ROP chain. Yeah, and that troubleshooting portion. So and all of that was pretty gold. Portion. And I'd like to. I I do not understand why OBS is seeing your audio come through, but it is not being saved into the the footage. Uh, I have Zoom going, so that's fine. But the first like twenty minutes of experimenting with Pwn in it, uh, I might just have to hokey pokey. But whatever. I'd, I'm glad we caught that sooner rather than. <laughs> yeah. 
Um, I mean, if you want to talk about pwning it, it's definitely a great tool. Yeah. But I, as I said, I like going through not only the manual, but also the automated. Because <clears throat> if you don't understand the manual, then you can't understand how the automated works. Yeah. That's why I, I did that basic, you know, let's go grab these addresses using Redel. Let's go grab these addresses out of, because you want to understand like what you're doing and why you're doing it. Did you want to do a, a little cool demo breeze through? Is that all right? Yeah. Sweet. All right. Um, Ready for me to share my screen? Yes. All right. You see everything okay? I do. Good font size? Yeah. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you. All right. So I got the challenge and libc. Um, I'm just going to use point in it to make it, you know, easy. So it gets linker, unsure of libc. I'm just going to remove the solve.py because I don't like it. Um, patch elf, interpreter. Cool. So we got the binary running. So now just to uh, have the binary open in Gidra, I'm going to open up Gidra. Let's import it. Just to have in Gidra if we need to reference it. Analyze. So the great thing about Pwn Tools is Pwn Tools is a lot of the automated address searching. So we already know that the overflow point is 136 bytes. So let's just start making our Python scripts. Three. Okay, peak process. Okay, so this is how you normally just set up a Pwn Tool script. But what we're going to do is, even though we're referencing the volume through a path and process, we can actually interact with it statically. So let's just do a context.binary equals, and we're going to say a binary, which is another variable, is going to equal volume. So what we're doing is we're saying, hey, we're going to make it so that if we need to use shell code, if we need to do any um, other things that are architecture dependent, um, Pwn tools automatically saves that, that information. So if we just do shellcraft.cat flag, it will give us 64 bit shell code, not 32 bit shell code, because it can read the architecture of the binary. And also with binary, if we need to reference it in any way, we can do that. So now that we have this sort of template set up, another thing that we can do to um, interact with the binary is store it as an elf object. And what this will allow us to do is it will allow us to um, search for addresses, grab values out addresses, do all that fancy stuff. So let's just call it um, um, vuln elf, and it's going to equal elf. And then we have our binary, OK? So now this should be able to run. And save it, of course. So this should run perfectly. Let's put a p.interactive at the end. All right, so now what we can do with this volume stuff is we can reference addresses, as I said, but we also want to bring in the libc. So let's just say libc is equal to elf, and then we have our libc.so.6. Cool, that should run fine. Great. So that's all working. Now to formulate our actual payload, we're going to say padding, and we're going to have our A's, which is 136. Okay. So this is, you know, as I mentioned earlier, the actual padding until we overwrite the instruction pointer. Now let's just make a payload variable and say it's equal to our padding. So after we do that, anytime we want to reference our actual ROP chain or payload, we just have the payload variable. We don't have to like say, hey, whenever we send it, payload and padding, it just makes it easier to um, work with stuff. So the first thing we have is we need to put in our pop RDI gadget. Now, Pwn Tools also comes with a thing called ROP, which is another sort of module. So you can say 
vuln rop equals rop, and we can pass in our vuln elk. Now, what this allows us to do is with pwn tools, we can search for rop gadgets. So we don't have to use rop gadgets to search for rop gadgets ourselves. So payload equals padding. Now let's do payload plus equals. And then let's do vuln rop dot find gadget. And then in here we send a list of what our gadget we want to find is. So it's going to be the pop RDI, then ret. Now what this will do is this will return a list of all the gadgets for pop RDI. We just want the first one. So we're going to do index zero. Then we're going to p64 that. <clears throat> so what this will do is this will find the address of the pop RDI gadget, pack it into 64 bit, and then uh, append it onto our payload. Then after that, we're going to do our um, global offset table for our set buff. So P64, then we're going to use our vuln elf, okay? Then we're going to do dot symbols, or not dot symbols, dot got, which is our global offset table, and dot set buff. So now without having us go into Gidra and search for a set buff in the global offset table, we can just reference it using the vuln elf dot got dot set buff. We could also use puts if we want it. We could use whatever symbol is in the global offset table. So we have our dot, we have our global offset table address. Now we need our phone elf dot. Now we need our PLT. So PLT and puts. So now instead of searching for Gidger for puts at the PLT, just use pun tools. And after we have that in our ROP chain, we do payload plus equals p64. We want to jump back to main. So we're going to do vuln elf dot symbols dot main. So just like that, we formulated a ROP chain without having to manually search for addresses. Nice. Then after that, we can do p dot send line, just send our payload. So now if we run this, we can see we have what we had before, where we had our <clears throat> A's and everything, and then our leak. Now, before you actually saw how, in order to grab this leak, we had to do a bunch of uh, receive lines. But to uh, make this easier for us, instead of doing p.send line, we can do p.send line after. And we can say, hey, after we find this VER exclamation mark, send our payload. So it's going to do a p.receive until VR, then send our payload. So that gets rid of that VR and then our payload. Then after that, we still have this that we need to receive. So we're just going to do p.receive until here, p.receive until. But also, there's a new line that's hidden back here, which we don't see. So we're going to have to put a new line. And if we run it, we see next we have is our address. So we didn't have to do p.receive line, guess, and check. We just did p.send line after and receive until. Now we can say our leak is equal to p.receive line. Then you do log.info. Then you can see we have our leak. We just have to strip the new line and unpack it. So we're going to do dot strip. We're going to do dot L just to make it eight bytes. And we're going to put null bytes. D64. So that should be our um, set buff. Oops. Um, I'm missing. Uh... And there we go. So there's our set buff leak. Nice all through Pwn tools without having to manually put in addresses. Now, after we do that, we have to do this thing called rebase the libc. Remember back when we were doing our manual sort of exploit script, we, uh, we, we had to calculate the libc base, calculate the offset. So what we can do is we can say, hey, let's just rebase the libc using this libc we have right here. So we can just say, hey, libc dot address, okay, rebase it. It's going to be the leak, which is our set buff, minus whatever libc dot symbols dot set buff is. 
So hmm. all it will do is just rebase our libc so that now whenever we do libc.symbols, it will be the actual address of, let's say, libc.symbols.printf. It will be the actual address of printf, libc.symbols.system, the actual address of system. That's cool. Which is very useful. You don't have to manually search for the addresses. You can just reference it in consoles. So if we just do log.info f libc base, and then we do hex libc dot you can see we have our libc base. Awesome. So now after we do that, we're going to conduct our second ROP shape. So payload is going to be equal patty again. And we're going to do payload plus equals, and we have to do our ROP gadget, ROP gadget find again, like up here. So ROP find gadget pop guy. Now remember for RDI, we actually put the address of binsh, and we found that through searching in Gidra. Well, funny enough, you can actually search through it in Pwn Tools. Nice. So instead of opening up Gidra and finding binsh, we can just do payload plus equals libc.search, and libc.search invites binsh. So this will search libc for the uh, address of binsh, but it actually returns a generator. So we're gonna to need to do next on that. So this will find the occurrence of, or the address of binsh and libc. And since we rebase libc, it's gonna be the actual address of binsh in memory while our program's running. And after we do that, we just dump the system. So we're gonna do libc.symbols.system. And after we do that, after, well, after system, it should <clears throat> be fine. But since we have stack alignment, we're gonna have to put in an arbitrary red instruction. So we're just gonna do use our ROP and pwn tools again, p64, vuln ROP.find gadget, ret zero. And as I said, it's gonna turn a list of all of the addresses that have a red instruction. We just want the first one. So now if we run this, we have, uh, oh, I forgot to send our payload. Send line payload, I always forget that. <laughs> now if we run it, we have a shell. Nice, that's all, awesome. All through Pwn tools. <laughs> no manually searching for addresses. And you can see how like, to take this a step further, how like the great, the people who just do this a lot are able to just whip out a Pwn tool script like that. Yeah, that's super easy, dang. Without even, without even looking at, they just look at Gidra once, that's it. Like we just, all, all the only thing we needed in Gidra was this uh, 136. That's awesome. You can also see how people, you know, decide to take an extra step and actually automate the whole thing. But yeah, super that's cool. How you do use it with Pwn tools, which speeds up a lot of the manual labor. <laughs> Holy crap. This was awesome. Yeah. <laughs> Took a took a uh, little challenge here and just tore it up and I think got everything out of it. Doing a manual analysis, going through troubleshooting and some other lessons learned, and then kicking it up with some automation. Heck yeah! Yeah. Sweet. So yeah, Pwn Tools definitely a great resource. So it sounds like the takeaways are GDB and GEF uh, or some other extension. Seemingly, GEF is, is doing really well for GDB mm -hmm. and Pwn Tools are yeah. rock stars. <laughs> I mean, I've been doing this for a while and all I've really used is just Pwn Tools, GDB, and GEF. Like, do uh, do you tend good. to do Ghidra most uh, or are you in like IDA or Binary Ninja or R2? So, yeah, um, I don't use Red R2 like okay. at all. Yeah. Um, I just, when working with the actual binary, it's just, I don't want to be fumbling around on key shortcuts to print stuff out. Like I just wanted to be in front of me there. Mm -hmm. Like as, as you saw, whenever we were going to the actual PLT and going to the PLT, we just clicked on a button and we were there. We didn't have to just type in some fancy like C, oh, is this it, is this it? Um, I use Gidra mostly because one, it's free. Um, 
Ida is like I think a one k per license. Yeah, yeah, an arm and a leg. It's pretty expensive. I don't, <laughs> I don't do this professionally, so. But um, I also don't use binary, binary ninja because again, it's paid. I just do this as a hobby. And um, there are other free ones out there like Hopper, um, Cutter, which is a graphical front end for Radare. I typically stick with the Gidra because it's more supported. And whenever you're getting to more advanced stuff, like more advanced reverse engineering, where you have to like rebuild structures, um, it's very useful for making custom types and all of that fancy reverse engineering stuff. Gidra by far is ahead in all of those tools. Awesome. Well, sweet. I think we should call it at this point. Yeah. <laughs> We've done a ton. I know your voice is probably getting getting a little tired of it. So I mean, thank yeah, you. If it's, yeah, it's a lot. I mean, I really just wanted to emphasize, you know, the debugging aspect because we took this very simple challenge and you can, you can just walk through a challenge and be done with it. Right. But you really learn how to solve it. If you get to another situation where, oh, something is different, will you be able to solve it? Do you get seg faults randomly? Just, you know, don't do the whole debugging process. Cool. This should be an absolute ton of content. So I super duper appreciate it. It will go well in the fundamental uh, beginner level stuff for, for Pico. I think this is really good for folks that are interested in this. So again and again, thank you. Uh, maybe sometime in the future, we can tackle another one of those crazy hardcore stuff. <laughs> Check tackle the uh, web browser. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, middle schoolers are doing web browser exploitation now, apparently. <laughs> I mean, that's insane. Sweet. Thank you again and again and again. Um, but hey, don't hesitate to reach out uh, if you want to do this again or maybe sometime in another week or any anytime else. Oh, yeah, I, I mean, no as I said, like I'm available, open. I mean, I, I mean, pretty much anything like for the Pico challenges, if it's just, you know, other stuff. Like one of the most difficult parts, a lot of people say binary exploitation is difficult and it's not that it's difficult. It's just that there's no good resources out there. Right. <laughs> like you can find tons of resources on web exploitation and everything, but if you want to get into binary exploitation, you're either doing the Intel instruction manual or whatever. Yeah. Thanks, man. Uh, I guess I'll catch up with you later. I'll let you go. <laughs> I mean, there's a lot of one, but if you want any more, I'm always down. I super appreciate it. Thanks so much, Matt. Yep. Take care, everybody. All right. Take care. We'll